welcome to our show, Coptic Stars. As you may have seen in this show, greatness is defined by many ways. How much you have, how much wealth you have, how many connections you have, how much power you got. But the true greatness is when you have all of this and you stay in your core humble. The true Coptic star that I'm so privileged to have today is engineer Mr. Nagib Sawirs. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to have you in the channel. No, it's my honor. Thank you, sir. Um, I did my little research, so please correct me. According to my research, you hold the Diploma of Mechanical Engineering with a Master's in Technical Administration from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, in addition to a diploma um, from the German Evangelical School in Cairo. You speak in addition to Arabic and English German. Did I miss anything in this area? A little French and a little Italian. Okay, very good. <laughs> I hope that you don't mind that we'll only speak English today. No, no, I don't. <laughs> because I don't know any other language by that. Now, as an introduction, our youth who are listening to you and would love to know you, we would like to know about your childhood, your family, how you were raised, what exactly type of family were you? It was, uh, I would say, the credit goes to my mother, I think. She raised us because my dad was nationalized by Nasser okay. and had to leave to Libya to restart and left my mother. And my mother, she married very young. She was, I think, 17 or 18. Yeah. And she, so he left her in 1965 which would have been 13 years after they were married. Yani. She must have been 30, 30 or something. And he went to Libya to restart again. So she raised us, all three brothers, and um, she, she raised us in a way, I always, to summarize, yani, I always say she taught us the love of God, the fear, love of God and the fear of God really? at the same time. And she taught us also how to feel for the poor. Yes. So she used to take us on Fridays, instead of the Gezira Club, she would take us to <laughs> the Zabalin, to the garbage collector's uh, quarters. Wow. For the whole morning, two, three hours, with all the mosquitoes and... Uh, the flies. Flies and the smell, the awful smell. And we would tell her, Mommy, you want to go to the club? She said, no, you need to see how these people are living, so you understand how privileged you are. Uh -huh. And so when you grow up, you don't forget these people. So my mother is a, is a very religious person. I mean, she has never skipped, uh, she's never missed a... a I don't want to interrupt you, but I had the pleasure of meeting your mom. Yeah. And she was sitting actually next to me in one of Father Dawood retreats. And we had the, the discussion about the, how, how much she loves the poor in Egypt. And she's making many projects for them. She, she's, uh, you know, she, I, I, I'm sure she's going to be going to paradise. She's sinless, yeah. Yes. She doesn't have any sins. She has never missed a church on a Sunday. She's never missed a Sunday church. Wherever she's traveling in the world, yeah. she prays every day and she reads the Bible two, three days. I and mean, she's like, I think in, when you come to adherence to the religion, I think she is... Uh, so speaking about that, you know, a lot of families now, there, there may be a disconnect between parents and children and absence of role model. You are very privileged to have a very good role model. What do you advise for kids who are growing and mom and dad may not have the same example? It's such a difficult question. Okay. I mean, I also had the role model in my dad. I will explain that later. Yes. But I think children should try if the... I mean, it's, the, it's actually the duty of the parents to try yeah. to come nearer to the kids. Because the kids nowadays, they have all the temptations to have their own life. So right. they're like exhausted on social media. Right. There is a uh, there is this fact that even kids when they go out together now out there they're all sitting on their phones tweeting and and uh, sending messages and they're not even enjoying their own social uh, gathering. Yes. So imagine the disconnect between them and their parents too. Correct. So it's a duty of both to try and uh, and, and 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 come nearer to each other because both will miss a lot. The parents will miss seeing their kids really and interacting with them and, and discovering them. Right. You know, the kids don't open up that easily, you know. And then the kids will also miss on getting the experience of the parents, you know. I mean, uh, I had a case. Um, 
It's like I try to push myself on my kids yeah. and call them every week two, three times so they feel that I'm there and I'm insisting on seeing them. And when I go to New York, because my kids live in New York, all three girls, uh, two girls in New York, one in Boston, uh, I make sure that I will have lunch spend twice in three days and yeah. spend time with them and that they come, can come back to me with their problems. Uh, I tell my girls, you know, you can consult me on your boyfriends. I'm, I have a... I'm good at that, I can give you some good <laughs> advice and like that. So it has to be, the advice is to the kids, don't miss on your parents because yeah. nobody will ever love you more than them. Nobody will ever want the best for you than them. So if you shut them off and you don't connect, you, you lose a lot, but you don't understand maybe yeah. and you might regret later. You know? Let's go to your dad. What did you learn from him? So my dad, I learned from him the importance of a good reputation. Mm. Uh, the importance of principles in life, uh, the importance of uh, hard work, uh, honesty, uh, per perseverance. That's the best thing. This, yes. is the, this is the one thing I, I re really learned from him. He is just, you can't stop him. He's a pre perseverant person, you know, when he puts something in his mind, he goes he after doesn't it. doesn't fail, and, yeah. And he's so uh, a workaholic all his life. And... Uh, I think we, all of us got some of his sense of humor, or at least me and my, one of my brothers. Your brothers, yeah. yeah. He has a big sense of humor, and he, he's kind. He uh, also has a heart to help people, you know. I mean, I remember when he was nationalized, he went be very quickly and distributed all his assets on his engineers. Really? Before the government takes the company. Yeah. Mr. Sawiers, um, can you run me through a very busy day in your life? I mean, sometimes we, and we are not even comparing ourselves to you, we say, oh, I'm very busy. But knowing how many companies you have to take care of, how many thousands of employees you have, run me through a typical day. When I'll, do you wake I'll, up? I'll, when I'll do you have sleep? to take you five years back. Okay. Because right now, I'm much more relaxed than I was. You're slowing. I'm slowing down a little bit because I start to get these age uh, symptoms. My back hurts. I lose my teeth. My hair is falling. <laughs> you look so young. So, so I start to feel like I need to take it easier. But like, let's say five years ago, so my typical day would be like that. I would wake up at 6.37. I'd put the news, CNN, CNBC, and I would read the newspapers for an hour, have a coffee. Eight o'clock, I'd be on my desk. I would work uh, uh, from eight till three, nonstop. Mm. And when I say nonstop, it's a hectic. I mean, I would have a, most probably I would have a meeting every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes. I have to read emails, I, uh, phone calls and everything. At three, I would go to my dad to have lunch. I have lunch with my dad every day. Really? Yeah, if he can't, if I don't go to him, he'll come and have lunch with me. I never, I'm very close to my dad, you know. Then I would go home and have a nap. <laughs> so I have a nap for an hour, okay. an hour, an hour, 15 minutes. Then I wake up, I take a shower, then I go back to the office. Mm. And I would work again from 7 till 10 o'clock at night. Uh, that's not typical in Egypt. I mean, I just do that because then I'm alone in the office and there is nobody. And I can take the access meetings I couldn't do in the morning and I can then read and have my quiet time. And then at 10 o'clock I go out. So I'm actually, a, but I have to admit, I'm a party animal. So I go, <laughs> I go out partying till one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, most of the day, still till now. I'm so impressed that you said that your relationship with your dad up till this time, that you almost have to insist on having lunch with him every day. Uh, you know, in the last 40 years, I would call him the first call in the morning. I'll go down to his office then I will have lunch with him. Then in the evening, I'll pass by him at home. That's just like, and if I go out, I used to, when he was a little bit in a better health, I always took him out with me when we go out at night. You know? He's 89 now. God bless. No, no, we were best of friends. And uh, it's very, I mean, everybody knows. I, mean, I think this is amazing for our audience, not just the youth, but their parents to learn how much investment we should invest in our children. As you said, you have to have a okay, relationship. Okay, I have bad news for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not sure my kids will do the same with me. Listen, you, every time you are in it's, New York, you have to spend time with no, them. No, so. but I'm not sure they will do the same. I have a very special relation with my dad. It's just like we were always best of friends. We used to travel in the summer together. And I'm just like the closest person to him, you know. It's amazing. My mother always needs my help to, <laughs> to, relate get, to, get, to, to get her things done with okay. him. So, but I hope my kids at least are half, become half of what I am with my dad. You are an amazing business person. What and when was your first business project? I was 16, uh, 16 years old and um, I heard that my, my friend of my dad, uh, we found out that, uh, no, a friend of mine told me that there is a guy who imported some air conditioning equipment that he didn't know what to do, they were wrong and he wants to sell it at any price. So I knew a friend of my dad that was working solely in air conditioning and he was, his workshop was just below my father's office. Okay. So I told my friend, we need not to connect the two together. So we took the air conditioning equipment, showed it to this guy, yeah. saw how much he wanted to pay for it, then went to the other guy and we made a spread yani, in between. <laughs> to the extent that we had to take the money and pay this and never really okay. connect them to each other. I remember we were 16 and uh, years old, we made 3,000 pounds at that time. We were 16 years old. Just to give you a, an indication, my monthly uh, allowance was two pounds. So it was like uh, a fortune at that time. This was my first deal. Yeah. And that's the first time I felt like trading is how trading can be yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, easy and so profitable, you know. That was my first deal. Or ask him. I Actually, yeah. before that, I was playing marbles in the club. <laughs> the marbles, and I was selling the marbles. That, that I forgot when I was a child. So we play marbles, and I would sell the marbles and take money. And so you started your business school yeah. much earlier than yeah. that. <laughs> I read that Oraskom is one of the most successful um, companies in the world. What does it mean to you, Oraskom? And how did it start? And where do you see it? It's very funny because, you know, the name was the telegraphic address of my father's company that got nationalized. Wow. And for some reason or the other, every time we ask our dad, what does the Oraskum go for? Okay, O goes for once, you understand that, but the rest. And for some reason he never, I think he had a partner he didn't like who was the abbreviation in the name or something. But it was his telegraphic address, so when Nasser nationalized the company, he used the telegraphic uh, address to start, restart his company. The name is coming from that. And then uh, we, were all, we had everything together as a family. And then we started um, having a different uh, style in business, the three brothers. Mm -hmm. So just to put it in a, in a simple way. So me, I'm the most adventurous, the most risk taker. My youngest brother is the most, uh, let's say, reserved. Uh, mm -hmm. Conservative. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and my middle brother is, a, is a, like a dreamer and like that. So, the styles were starting to not to match. And uh, also we had a situation where my middle brother was uh, leaving his wife and uh, my father was not in agreement. So in any case, my father came one day and said, listen, you need to split all the work. Each one takes his work when I'm alive. So I don't want any friction later on, which shows how wise Very he is. Very wise. Yeah. Very wise. And we, we started and we took all the Oraskom. Each one took his own Oraskom. So I was Oraskom in the telecommunication. And my brother, the youngest one, was Oraskum Construction. And the middle one went into tourism and he did Ilguna yes. in development. And I think it's, um, it's God's blessing that made all three do well. You know, it's, it's definitely has, God has a, has a hand has a in, plan, in, yeah. uh, for all of us. And especially with me, I mean, uh, I mean for me, I always feel so protected by my faith that uh, I, I fear no one. I mean, it's just very... Uh, I think uh, my faith is just, uh, I'm very proud of my faith. We are very proud of your faith. So we spoke about faith, but let me ask Nagib Sawiers, what is the most, the thing that you fear the most? God. God's, uh, I fear him uh, being angry for my sins. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest fear. That's the only thing I fear. I mean, to be honest with you, nothing can scare me on earth an army of evil people. I fought the Muslim Brotherhoods in Egypt face to face. Yeah. Alone. 
and I say alone because there were no other businessmen who wanted to join this fight, and I was not scared. I was not very scared, and I fought them face to face. I didn't do, do like they do underground, and they, you know they're uh, they're totally dishonest, not straightforward people, you know. But me, I fought them like Saidi, you know, like for face to face, you know. Yeah. They don't even have this kind of honor. They always play. And I was not afraid, yeah. So you brought up uh, a very important point. During the Muslim Brotherhood rise, almost 99% of all business people took their business out of Egypt. And you were one of very rare people who stood your ground staying in Egypt, believing in Egypt and believing in your faith. Can you comment on that? Well, now you're going to burn my speech. <laughs> uh, <we're not laughs> Later on, you know. Yeah. But, uh, to, to explain to you, I, I will start, I mean, we're here together, so I'll yeah. start my speech with this. You have to understand that Egypt was a Christian country till the seven centuries. Right. And if the Copts were not really abiding by the right cheek and left cheek uh, message of Jesus, mm -hmm. I think we would have not been where we are today. You know, the, the Copts are somehow in their nature, they are not non-violent, yes. they're very peaceful, but they're also submersible. They, they don't confront, yeah. they prefer to, you know, which, uh, that's why many people tell me you don't, you're not you're really, not Coptic. <laughs> you're not Christian, you're not Coptic, you know. Yeah. So, uh, for me, I, when Egypt was a Christian country of the 7th century, imagine these people coming and thinking they will, they will kick us out from our own country, it just was um, not going to happen. Yeah. And the other, I remember when I used to go to church, you know, during the Muslim brotherhood, I was <laughs> going to church every Sunday. <laughs> that, you know, when you're stuck and you need yeah, God, yeah, yeah. that's where you go to church right. mostly, you know. So I would go to church and then I would fight. Every, all the women from the other side would come to me after the death, you know, and say, oh, Engineer Nagib, we are praying for you. So I was very mad. I got mad at them. I said, listen, I don't want you to pray for me. I'm here to pray for myself. And by the way, I have an amazing connection. What are you going to do against these people? They'll take your houses, they'll take your jobs, they'll kick you out of this country. You need to know that this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So please, stop praying and go fight with me. So they will all go back and say, either they, I'm crazy, that I'm crazy, or they will think, oh no, it's not our job, like they have to. Because I'm very mad at the Copts who were in Egypt at the, at the seventh century. Because when you read the history, yeah. 3,000 soldiers, headed by Amr ibn al-As or whatever his name was, coming from uh, Saudi Arabia, mm. invading Egypt, 3,000 soldiers. Mm. Uh, the estimate of the population at that time was maybe 400,000, 450,000. So, and the Romans already were occupying Egypt. So even the Copts were used to live under occupation and nobody tr tried to challenge the Romans. Mm. And when the uh, Muslims came, nobody tried to challenge them too. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a mistake, it's a historical mistake, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. because the Coptic Church is the oldest church in the world. Yeah. It's the oldest church in the world. Even in the West, sometimes I have to remind them when I, make, when I speak to in religious Foreign conventions, yeah. I tell them, no, we have the oldest church in the world. So there's a duty, Marcus came to Egypt 90 after Christ, yeah. and he started Christianity. So at the 700th century, instead of fighting, we just be invaded like that and convert under the sword or, or flee into the monasteries or, or pay money to stay, you know. Okay. But, and we lost our language. Look what a shame. I mean, we're not, I, I mean, I, I like the minorities of the world who preserve their language, their heritage and their religion. Coming back to faith and God, I want to say a couple of words and I want to hear your comment. When I say Nagib Sawiris and family, what, do you, what is the value of family in your life? You know, uh, I must say that uh, family is the most important thing in life. It should be the most important thing in life. I think. I have to admit that I came short a little bit because of my workaholic mechanism, because I was insane in my work, you know. Mm -hmm. 
I have to admit also that I wanted to be uh, one of the top. Uh, top people, not for the money, not for the sake of having the money, no, not the money. The money is like in school grade, uh, grades, when you want, like I, want, I was the first in my school. So I wanted to, I, I, there's a story to that. I was never the first, but I became the first because I, one of my teachers or so a German told me, you're, you're yeah. a waste. God I, gave you everything and you don't want to be the best. I you should be the best, yeah. yeah. And he gave me the advice and I followed it and I challenged him and I became the best. And Took since 100 then, pounds. Yes. I know and the since story. then, I, became, I liked the fact that I became the best and I stayed in that career. But I came short on my family, not on my kids, I would say, but with my, wife, with my wife. I would say I was always taking from her time to work for the work and for my kids. So she came short a little bit. So I think family is the most important thing, you know, but I wouldn't say that I scored first there. Yeah. Okay, if I say friends, Friends are important in life. I mean, I, I, and you can only have three or four friends. Whatever you, if you think you have 20 friends, then something, you, then they're not friends. They're not friends. I think friends are really the three, four persons that when you say friends, they come to your mind immediately. And you must have known them for 10, 20, 30 years. They don't come over a day and night like that, like long. So the people who are listening to you and some of them, let's say their median age is 25 years. What is the most ver important virtue that you like to see in a friend? If you're talking to one of your daughters, for example, what would you say? In a friend, yeah. uh, first, kindness. Mm. It's the most important. Uh, for me, it's the most important. I would never have a friend who's not kind because kindness is, uh, is important. You want to be sure that you, this person next to you will give you kindness, will be kind, he will not deceive, he will not cheat, he will not uh, hurt you. He will spread kindness and you can depend on him, you know. I know you, you brought money before, but I want to put it in its perspective. What is money means to... Power. power. Okay. Purely power, nothing else. I don't, like, I, I always wanted to have the money to have the power to do good. Of course, there are side, nice side effects, you know, you, you drive a nice car, you have a nice house and all that, but it was never uh, the reason why I wanted to have the money. I mean, I wanted to have the money in order to... It's like when I fought... Yes. When I fought the Muslim Brotherhood. I could have not fought them without uh, money. The, the money and the power. Because money, I had my channel, my TV channel, which was losing money, but I, I kept it to fight them. I had a newspaper, which was losing money, and I kept it to fight them. and. Uh, uh, also, uh, everything I did uh, uh, was costing a lot, you know, to fight them, you know. So if I, if I, if I was r limited in my resources, I could have not have fought them. And also, you know, you can do so much good with money. I mean, like I, I've seen with my own eyes, I prefer to do good with the money where I go and see it myself. So I'm not the type who donates to organizations or says I'm going to give half of my money to charity. No, I like to see the good I do. And I get tears in my eyes when I see it. It's like, maybe it's egoistic, but uh, I can give you one, an example. So I built these, when I went to South Sudan, so I found out the kids are living in, 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 in the mud till here. They have public toilets, they have no housing, no shelters, nothing. This despair, you know. So I, bought children playgrounds, three or four big children playgrounds, manufactured in Egypt, and the cost in transportation, the price of them, of them, because to get anything, and I put these children there, and then I went for the inauguration with the kids from the schools. It became, the schools now send all the kids to these playgrounds because they don't have a playground in the school, you know. Mm. And I saw the kids going there, and I started getting tears in my eyes to see the kind of happiness that you did with so little money. So little money was negligible, I mean, compared to what you could do, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in a way, I like to see, um, uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a history with the South Sudan, you know, because yeah, the know. liberator of South Sudan, John Karank. Yes, uh, a good friend of yours. A very close friend of mine. I know. Yeah, and yeah. I always supported him, and he was like a semi-saint. Saint, this man. yeah. yeah. He's a, this he's guy an was an man. amazing man, yeah. He really would, would I spent one week with my wife in his camp in South Sudan. 
again, we went to see the school that his wife was uh, handling and we started crying, me and my wife. The kids were sitting on the mud. There was no even... Blackboard. Blackboard, yeah. no chairs, no desks. So you, you brought a couple of names. You brought, you brought uh, the president of, uh, or the defender of South Sudan. Let me throw at you a couple of names. I want to see your comment. Pope Shenouda. Uh, Pope Shenouda. Uh, he uh, was, uh, I mean, I, I, I can tell you, you know, because I was very close to him. I know. So I tell you, the, the, the nicest thing about Pope Shenouda, when I used, I had like long flights with him, 12 hours, 8 hours. When I met him, I wouldn't know whether he is a pope, an engineer, a contractor, a financier, an administrator, a holy man, a state man, a comedian. Uh, also because his sense of humor was, uh, you know, amazing. He was a combination of all that mm. and tough when he needs to be tough and wise when he needs to be wise and holy also. I mean, he was an amazing character. But, you know, I, I had a... I made a big mistake and he's uh, towards the end with him, you know, which I regret till today, you know. So I asked for forgiveness and I apologize many times. And what killed me is I don't know whether he, when he passed away he had forgiven me or not. He was not a forgiving. So I would say about his character, he was not a forgiving person. Me, when you apologize, even if you did me bad, but you apologize, I'll accept your uh, apology. But you have to sincerely know that you did something, acknowledge that you did something wrong. And I acknowledge very clearly that I did something wrong. And I was not sure that he forgave me or not. One bishop tells me, no, it was okay, he forgave you, but uh, he's not the bishop that I would trust what, uh, <laughs> mostly. Yeah. I mean, knowing Pope Shenouda, he, he is in paradise, I'm sure he for forgave you. Okay, how about Magdi Aoub? Magdi Aoub, I think, is a, a saint on earth. I mean, when you know him, he's just a, a selfless person. I mean, someone who just, I don't think he does anything for himself. He just lives there to save lives, to, he's working all the time, trying to do one dream after the other, creating this uh, heart uh, center in Aswan. Now he wants to do one in Africa and Rwanda. He's just a man who has been so devoted to his work and to uh, saving lives and uh, very modest to the extreme of, uh, as I told you, naivety. Yeah. But an uh, amazing person. I know your dad is probably a role model, but if I ask you, who is your role model beside your dad? It, it can be one of people in the history. Whom do you admire the most? I admire uh, in the history, Annie. History or yeah. current, it's up to you. Yeah, I admire uh, Churchill because uh, he's like me. I mean, I don't surrender even if I'm weak. Yes and I don't allow anybody to bend my arm. I mean, I tell everybody, I, if someone tries to bend my arm and put me in a situation where I'm weak and I have to uh, sit on the negotiating table, so I will not sit. So the, the people ask me, but you, yani, what do you do when he's bending you? I said, I take the pain. And I, 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 but I will never sit when, I'm, when someone thinks that he has me now and I'm forced to, to like when the Muslim brother would, uh, went after my dad and my younger brother and they slammed them with the 14 billion tax, which was fictitious, and prevented them from traveling, all we, what they did to themselves by doing that is made me put 10 times more the, the fight, you see? Yeah. Because they don't know my mentality. Hmm. So I'm the kind of person, if you shoot at me, I'll go forward, I won't go back. I will go forward and faster. You know? So uh, Churchill was like that. When he was weaker and, and Hitler was on his winning spree, he decided not to give in and to, and to fight, you know. So he's one of my... Uh, and also I like uh, the Prime Minister of... Uh, currently, I, I like uh, Tony Blair. Oh, the President. I like uh, President Clinton. If I would ask you Ilgona Cinema uh, Festival, this is one of the achievements, in my opinion, that no one have done like it. What does it represent to engineer Nagib Sawiris? 
Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a cinema addict, so I'm a movie fan. I, I watch a movie every day in my life. Every day before I sleep, it's my relaxation. Some people take Advil, some people take some... Uh, for me, it's uh, watching a good movie, puts me in a good mood. So I'm addicted to movies. Like I've watched all the old Arabic uh, the movies, I watched all the American movies, I watch a lot of movies. You know? So movie is my passion. It's like, read, you know, when you used to read more books in the past. Yes. Now I watch more movies. Okay. So I have a passion for movie. Also, I'm friends with most of the people who are in this industry. I'm good friends with them because they are, you know, the light of, they put color to life. I read that Adil Imam said I would have not attended any festival except my friend Nagib Sawiris invited me. Yeah, he actually has refused to go to receive any yes. accreditation except because he knows that I adore him and we were like we are in touch and we're friends and I, I, I love him so much, you know, he's just brought so much happiness to yes. us, all so of us. All millions of people. Yeah. So I, out of love of the cinema, I decided to do this festival in Guna and also it was to give uh, Guna uh, more what it Name. deserves because yeah. my middle brother he has created I would call it, uh, like a paradise and uh, it's like a perfection of perfection it's the most amazing place in Egypt when you are there you don't feel you are in Egypt yes. yeah. because of the uh, uh, cleanness and the discipline and the quality of the people and, and the environmental uh, issues that he has taken care of and so so I always felt he did not uh, yet achieve uh, get what he deserves for accreditation so I said I will do this. Uh, Film Festival, because it will put an international light on, on, on. on Guna and on Egypt, because yes, Egypt, yes. you know, was suffering from uh, uh, terror. And the best way to fight uh, extremism and fundamentalism and uh, all that is by culture and by cinema. So it was a win-win all the way. Yeah. It's a beautiful idea. Is there anything Nagib Sawir's regrets? Oh. Well, I regret uh, that I had come short a little bit with my family, so I, uh, I think uh, my uh, wife has done such a great job with the kids, and uh, really, so I'm really grateful. I think I was not so fair in the time I gave her. I regret, uh, that's actually the, uh, what else? I don't regret going, having gone to politics because people tell me why you went to politics. I don't want to go into politics. My only reason was to fight the... the uh, people don't understand that because they tell me, I don't regret that, but, but some people told me, what did you do in politics? I, I only entered into politics in order to be able to legally fight the Muslim Brothers because I needed yeah. the political cover, you know. I couldn't fight them. But I think besides the shortage with the... Uh, this that I mentioned with my family and so on, I... There is no other regrets. No other, other regrets. Of course, some of the sins, of course, I say I've sinned, you know. Some sins were really ridiculous, so no need to do <laughs> have them. <laughs> okay, my final question. Um, how do you incorporate Christ in a practically, and, and we really need to learn this, in your life? You know, it's very... I will tell you something very funny, because, you know, I was a Sunday school teacher. In really? church. Oh, I didn't know that. So when I was 18, 19, I was teaching the kids the Bible from age 6 to 8 for three years. I would sacrifice my weekend to teach the kids the Bible and so on. And, and I teach them very well and everything. But my real faith developed not through reading the Bible, not through teaching the kids, came into my practical life during my business life, which is very, I can, I, till now I can't comprehend how this happened, you know. But it was like that because it's funny, you know, that I exercised my faith to the maximum. So it gave me a lot of power all the time, you know. I mean, I would go into, a, a, I give the, this is not the real story, but, you know, imagine you are in a room, there are 10 people and you're alone and you have to fight these 10 people. Right. I would go and start to hit the first one because I know I'm right and they are evil. And I would tell God, please, can you come and help? And I would know that he's on my side and I will win. And the funny part, I always win. It's crazy. I mean, and also, because of this faith that has become so strong in me, I, God didn't need to have um, miracles happen to me, but they happened. 
So they happened, and I believe they happened because I didn't need them to be to have this You're degree. Not looking for them. I yeah. think if anybody else would have uh, went into th these experiments, he maybe God would have not responded, you know. But he responded to me. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that in my life, I've asked God two times for something to happen instantly. And it happened. Even my father told me, don't tell anybody that. Don't say these stories. I don't know why he told me that, but I don't follow this advice. I don't know why, because I feel it will help other people, sure, you know. It's amazing. I think, but it happened to me twice. I would tell God, please, can you do this now? And it will happen. And that happened. So I don't know why he listened to me, but I think he li I always believe he listened to me because he knew that I'm, my belief Faithful. is beyond any doubt. I know I said this last question, but let it be my last now. Because you, you said something, remind me to ask you. Failures in your life. Failures in some of our lives can break me, can make me not go forward, can make me lose faith in God. I am certain that you must have had obstacles, failures, stumblings. How did it shape you? How did you come overcome them? I advise to, the, to, to us and to the youth. You will laugh. You know, the failures actually, they made me always feel, remember that you are not Superman, you know, and like what I always tell my kids, you know, you know, puppy can do anything, just don't worry, you know, so. But uh, they actually, always failures are good because they make you feel, okay, you're not just everything you're going to do is going to uh, yeah, succeed, so you need to learn that you can fail. But the important thing of failures is to learn from your mistake, you know. So I always say that an intelligent person is the one who does a mistake one time only. Mm. And a stupid person is the one who keeps on repeating the same mistake, you know. So I would say with a lot of um, uh, conviction that uh, I learned from my failures and I didn't repeat them. Like I would act, like never take a decision in anger. Uh, or never decide on a project because you want to show someone right. something. I, I have my failures. I have big failures, two, three in my life. And the funny part is people always know only your victories and they don't know your failures. So, but it's normal, you know. And you, but the good thing about it is always I thank God always. Yeah. Post every failure, I thank Him. Because I say it could have been worse, you know. When something bad happens, I always thank God. And people think, yes. I said yes, because it could have been worse, you know. As long as my family is good and their health and like that, what do I care about the rest? Listen, I, I can't thank you enough. No, you're welcome. This is really an honor to have um, one of the, our Coptic stars, if not the, the Coptic star, who, as you have seen, you can learn a lot from his wisdom, his relationship with his wife, his children, his family, his failures, his successes, his strong faith in God, his strong faith in his roots, I think a lot of lessons we can learn from this. Again, I'm very grateful to the it's time you spent with us. Thank you. May God bless you and hope to see you again. Thank you, Shabbat. Thank you so much. Thank you.